Hello, you multi-magnetic majestics, and thank you to Arong9617 for that mock mention. I'm Ralphie, in the Bothy, somewhere, anywhere, nowhere in particular, just somewhere in the middle <coughs> of the Irish Sea. And I'm keeping dry because I'm sitting on a rock in the middle of the Irish Sea, which allegedly was thrown by an Irish giant, right, who was chasing a Scottish giant off of Ireland. Right, so that's what the legend says. Uh, and there is some truth in legends, by the way, but it, you just need to understand the, the, the level of imagination to decipher these ancient legends. And uh, the island is full of legends, and I'm sure this little bothy here has its own little legend. I'm still to dis get to the bottom of it. I'm pretty sure there's a there's actually quite a friendly spirit here in the the Bothy, but it has had its troubles in the past, like meth many Bothies do, when life was an awful lot harsher for the majority of people. I mean, this building here it goes back over 200 years. Um, has a, in fact, the whole estate really has a very interesting history. As does port. Port is fortified wine from Portugal, hence the name. This is a white port. I'll bring it up, let you see the glass. You can see that is not the typical colour for a port. It is, it's not white. I would describe it as a peach apricot and um, this is a port made from white wine grapes and fortified with white wine brandy. It has a slightly musty fungal note on the nose which you get from spirits which have been, well, when you get from fortified wines, sure, it's not a spirit. Spirits would be up at 50% plus in a cask. This is at something like between 18 and 22% alcohol. And they'll maybe bring the strength of the alcohol down over time, unless it brings itself down. But essentially, the white port spends some time in casks just to settle and round off in the same fashion that red port, which were tend to be a lot more familiar with, does exactly the same. And of course, the very interesting and never boring Tawny Port. I have to add that port's readily available as a standard generic drink in the supermarket. And I highly recommend you get a bottle because it's basically like a very enriched, enriched, higher strength red wine and a fairly soft red wine. It's not full of tannins, it's not full of harshness from the from the skins and, and, and the grape seeds and all the rest of it. It does tend to mellow very quickly. And I'm a much bigger fan of port than I am of some other fortified wines. I find Marsala or even Malaga to be too sweet because essentially they're dessert fortified wines from Spain. Um, and I find sherry from Spain generally insipid. Um, if you want to buy high strength prune juice with a touch of cheese in it, yeah, then you buy a standard bottle of sherry, the particularly dry sherry. What is worse, I mean, there's a very good reason why the tradition in Britain used to be for what's called cream sherries, which essentially meant sweetened sherries because it's, it made them pal pal palatable. And even now, anyone going into any bar anywhere in, in the UK and asking for a sherry, you know, the, the bar professional is going to probably say with a laugh, you know, we haven't been asked for this for years. So the modern palate's really into aftershock and uh, Bacardi breezers and Red Bull and Jägermeister called Jäger Bombs. You know, very heavily confectionery flavoured beverages, 
which are the absolute antithesis of an old sherry. Now, some of these old sherries can be really good, but you'll find it's not the mainstream producers that produce them. It's the smaller sherry houses that tend to stick to the more traditional way of doing things. So when you get your white port, and I do recommend you buy a bottle, put it in the fridge, chill it just as you would a white wine, and then put your nose to it. You'll find that this kind of fresh gummy fruits, almost confectionery white fruits coming through, like wine gum notes, if you're into that particular traditional British confectionery. The taste is great. Clean, fresh, zesty. It's a wonderful palate cleanser. It's, it's like a, a drier, more elemental sauternes at a higher strength. And they're inexpensive, by the way. White port is not going to burst your wallet. And it's when you have a bottle of white port, you can then understand through the direct comparison of smell and taste as to why it's working in a whiskey as an experiment in finishing a single malt whiskey. Quite exotic, quite a bit of a risk take, highly unusual for any distilleries to be using white port casks. One, because there's not many white port casks available because people don't drink it. And secondly, because um, Sauternes or Dechem, Chateau Dechem finishes are considered far more prestigious as a white wine influence um, in, in, a, in a whiskey. And even now you're getting Chardonnay and Semillion Blanc and all the rest of it. But I think distillers are actually finding from experience that even when you get a wine cask, you really want to thoroughly rinse it out. In other words, you overnight it with a water fill out the tap and the end of a hose pipe, you fill the cask up and you just rinse out any residual um, white wine that's in that cask because what you're wanting is the much more measured integration of white wine influence from what's actually impregnated into the wood of the cask in the staves and also at the same time you want a little bit of that wood influence as well so you don't want to have a short term fix because you basically didn't even rinse out or empty your, your white wine cask. And of course the other risk is that white wine, um, not so bad with port because it's bottled at, you know, it's coming out of the cask at just under 20% or thereabouts. But with white wines and red wines as well, as soon as you empty the cask, you cannot leave these casks lying about for very long because the alcohol strength is already low and it quickly gets lower as the cask begins to dry out and the what's left of the alcohol is basically leaking out the, the bung or basically, particularly if it's in a, a sunny day and the cask's outside, uh, the alcohol level's r dropping gradually due to evaporational losses. And the result is that the bacteria can then creep in because the alcohol's volume is no longer there to protect, protect the cask. So this is what happens when sour casks start to sour. When they sour, they really flatten a whiskey badly. They can have a very bad influence on whiskey when you use a sour cask. And when a cask's gone beyond sour and start to gone, become absolutely contaminated with bacterial infection. It becomes distinctly cheesy, like rancid, soft French blue cheese. That's the smell you get. At that point, frankly, the cask is completely unusable. It is unrecoverable. Absolutely forget it. The distiller cannot use it. They have to basically cut it up, put it in a bonfire, or sell it to someone for garden furniture but it's going to be smelly garden furniture. Do you know what I mean? So, we're coming back to the whiskey now in tandem with the white port. So the whiskey, of course, from a previous review, was matured in a white port cask for a short period of time in the form of a finish. 
Now we've got the white port for direct comparison. So we'll start with the whiskey. A slightly a slightly hot spicy Glen Scotia that could have done with a couple of years in a fresh bourbon cask. That's the way I'm reading this. But with the white pour, you can see that the white port has, it's almost kind of not got the same flavour profile, but the same effect as a bourbon cask, except to be effective, it simply needs longer. Absolutely needs longer. So that's my appraisal assessment. There comes a point when we get into whiskey, particularly if we're starting to explore wine finishes, port finishes, sherry finishes, Madeira finishes, Marsala, Malaga, Eau de Vie finishes, what next, Grappa finishes, Tequila finishes, um, Ale finishes. Either we just kind of keep all these permutations at a distance and stick to core range, or if we're going to go exploring them and start spending our money on them, we really need to have a point of reference to explain what's going on to our palates. And this is why when you have a sherried whiskey, if you have a bottle of Oloroso sherry in the house and it's not expensive, it's a really handy thing to have. And you might even add a few drops of Oloroso sherry to the whiskey to further, further finish it. You know, these personal finishes are perfectly doable. You just need a little bit of time and patience. And there's such a lot to be learned from doing it. But in the meantime, port, very interesting, but it's not an outstanding Glen Scotia, but it's certainly very competent. And for Glen Scotia fans, a very interesting experiment. I'm Ralphie, hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, click likey, subscribey, all the nice stuff. Uh, I have a Patreon channel as well, and uh, sit back and get yourself a decent single malt because uh, my next review will be 999 and then the review after that will be, let me see now, what comes after 999? Oh, there we go again. <sighs> I've forgotten already. <laughs> I'll remember when the time comes. See you soon, pa pals and mates.